This is Mulan. You know her from Disney's Mulan. You know this outfit and this one. But are they accurate? We got this fashion historian. Hi, I'm Beth Charleston, and I teach fashion history at Parsons the New School for Design. To walk us through what the movie got right and what they got wrong about these looks. First, let's establish the setting. Mulan takes place in northern China, somewhere between 420 and 589. And how do we know this? We know this because of the Ballad of Fa Mulan, the source for Disney's animated film, which is a short poem traced to circa 420 to 589 during the Northern Wei period of the Northern and Southern dynasties of China. Fa Mulan. Present. The ballad was passed down verbally until it was recorded in writing in the 12th century. Are there any other clues? The mountainous scenes lead us to believe this could be the northern part of China. There's an even bigger here, hint here. Here and here. I will take the main troops up to the Tung Shao Pass and stop Shan Yu before he destroys this village. This doll came from a village in the Tung Shao Pass. The Tung Shao Pass was located here. Let's get into the looks. First up, Mulan's everyday look. When the movie opens, we see Mulan in her everyday clothes, the garments she would have when she's doing her chores or working around the house. Let's draw Mulan's everyday wear from the undergarments up. First up, the underwear. And poised. Punctual. <laughs> undergarments for women during Mulan's time consisted of two layers, Zhang Yi, middle clothes, and neyi, inner clothes. The first layer would consist of two parts, a pantalet and a mochong. The pantalet covered the body from waist to knees or longer. It tied around the waist via attached ribbons. The garment could be open-seamed at the crotch in order for a woman to relieve herself discreetly, or it could be closed-seamed like modern undergarments. And a mochong covered the upper part of the torso, both the breast and the stomach, and was open in the back. It was shaped in a triangle or a diamond and tied around the neck and back like a halter. Decorative embroidery, applique, or patchwork could be added to personalize this intimate garment. Mulan's plain looking pantalet in a subdued color looks historically accurate, though as an intimate piece of clothing worn next to the skin and not meant for public viewing, she might have had more leeway to wear bright colors. Let's move on to the second layer. The second layer of clothing called Zhang Yi or middle clothing would consist of an under jacket and possibly an underskirt. These were usually left plain and the collar and sleeves of the second layer of clothing would be visible, adding color and interest to the ensemble. The outer skirt might be shorter than the underskirt for the same reason. The under jacket would have been asymmetrical, closing left over right with side tie closures or small buttons to secure it. The underskirt would tie around the waist. The way that Mulan's upper chest is visible in this outfit would not be considered proper, since it showed too much skin. Also, her under jacket cuffs are not visible. Moving on to the third layer. Ru Chin is an ensemble of traditional Chinese attire once worn by both sexes, but by Mulan's time was worn only by women. It consisted of a blouse, Ru, and a wraparound skirt, the chin. Mulan is shown wearing a wide sash in blue that covers the point where the blouse is tucked into the waist of the skirt. These are her everyday clothes and work clothes in which she needs to be able to move easily. I'm here! Dyes used for coloring yarns and lengths of textile were derived from natural sources, indigenous to the region and also available via Silk Road trade. Various shades of brown and rust were common amongst laborers and farmers because they effectively hid dirt and wear. Color yellow, derived from safflower, would be reserved for the royal household in later years in China. Down to the shoes. Since she is doing chores, such as walking outside to bring her father tea and feeding the chickens, her shoes would have been somewhat rough. Her everyday shoes would have leather soles and wool uppers. For the harsh winters in northern China, shoes would be padded with additional layers of wool that would be held in place by quilting. Quilting also provided minimal decoration. 
Shoes would be symmetrical with no designated left or right side. Even today, when specific shoes for the left and right foot are the norm in China, ethnic groups produce symmetrical shoes. This simplifies the shoemaking process and also reduces the difference in abrasion between the two sides. Now, the hair. A woman's hair was a point of pride for herself and her family. It was grown long and put up in a variety of styles. Overall, Mulan's everyday outfit is somewhat accurate. So here's what Mulan's everyday wear would have looked like compared to the movie. Let's move on to Mulan's matchmaker outfit. During this time period, it was very important for your family to marry well. Obedient, who work fast paced, with good breeding, and a tiny wit, you'll bring honor to us all. Which is why Mulan's matchmaking outfit, which she also wears while singing Reflection, is so elaborate. Let's take a look at this outfit from the undergarments up. First up, the undergarments. Again, her undergarments would have consisted of a mochon and pantalets, perhaps made of finer material, such as silk. Now, the middle clothes. Here we see an image from a Han era woman wearing a red mochon with the white collar of an underrobe. Next up, the main garments. This outfit is a more elaborate version of Ru Chin with trailing or broad sleeves that cover Mulan's hands. These are called Guang Shou. The idea of wearing two pieces of clothing as opposed to one main garment, like a robe, appealed to the Chinese idea of harmony and unity and is symbolic of the relationship of order between heaven and earth. Moving on to the shawl. Since it is a somewhat small piece of fabric, Mulan shawl might be silk. During the Northern Wei Dynasty, the silk industry had grown far beyond household production to organize factories and subsidize mulberry farming. Silkworms, the source of all natural silk, depend on mulberries for their diet. Next, the shoes. We do not see Mulan shoes in this ensemble as her hem is so long. But if we did, they would be handmade. The shoes of this outfit would have silk uppers instead of hemp or wool. Mulan might also wear a shoe called the Chow To Lu, which is more of a slipper type shoe with an upturned toe. Women wore these shoes with long gowns so that they would not trip over their hem or have to hold it. In addition to jade being thought of as a symbol of beauty in Chinese culture, it also signifies goodness, preciousness, and purity. Mulan's family would not have been able to afford this necklace. The matching size and color of the beads, indicative of copious amounts of stone editing and shaping, would have made this necklace cost prohibitive for a farming family. The necklace seen here is from the tomb of Farang, a magistrate's wife from northern China who lived circa 500 AD, approximately the same time as Mulan. It consists of gold pieces, crystals, and 42 pearls, but the green beads are made from glass. Next, the hair. The hair ornament that Mulan wears is also known as Zanhua and would have been made of silk thread wire and copied from a style worn by women at court. It was made from silver or gilded metal with kingfisher feathers and a semi-precious stone in the middle. Mulan's hair is styled in a simple bun, wrapped with fabric and accentuated with a comb. A more elaborate double bun, worn side to side or front to back, was also popular at the time. When Mulan leaves the comb on her parents' bed table before leaving for the army, it is slightly different from the one her mother affixes to her hair. Lastly, the makeup. Powder, used to whiten the complexion, was made by grinding rice into a fine flour consistency. Rouge, to color the lips, is believed to have been made from the extracted juice of leaves from red and blue flowers. Animal fat was then added until the desired consistency was achieved. Eyebrows, which the Chinese believed were linked to a woman's fate, were a focal point of the face. They were darkened or reshaped using soot from burnt willow branches. For Mulan's matchmaker outfit, the clothing is pretty accurate. So here's what Mulan's matchmaker outfit would have looked like compared to the movie. 
though Disney took liberties with the accuracy of Mulan's outfits. The theme of empowerment still rings true. And here's what Mulan's outfits would have looked like if she had lived in history. 